Hello, and welcome to the Addressing the New Complexities in Key Management Interoperability, KMIP version next. We have three presenters today. The first will be Bob Griffin. He is the Chief Security Architect from RSA EMC. The second is Tony Cox, Business Development Manager at Cripsoft. And the third is John Lisebor, the CTO at Quintessent Labs. My name is Dee Schur from Oasis. Here is my email address. I will be following up after the webinar with everybody to give you a link to where the webinar will be located on the OASIS website. Just a few quick tips before we get started. When you downloaded the software, a control panel appeared on the right side of your screen. If you would like to collapse the control panel, click on the left, I'm sorry, the orange arrow on your left tab. If you would like to open other browsers during the webinar, Simply select View from the top menu and choose Windows. We will not be taking questions directly at the end of this webinar, but I will be collecting your questions during the entire webinar. We will get back to you after the webinar. We will follow up with every question. We will follow up by email. So just type your question in the question box and I will be recording all those questions. Again, this is my um, email address, and I will follow up with everyone in a separate email. Thank you so much, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Bob. Thank you very much, Dee. Um, and again, this is Bob Griffin. Um, I'm Chief Security Architect at RSA, uh, the security division of EMC since 2006. Um, uh, I'm also the co-chair of the KMIP Technical Committee. I've been the co-chair since uh, the committee was established in February of 2009, along with Subhash uh, Sankura Tripathi of, of NetApp. Um, you may know RSA um, as uh, the sponsor of the RSA conference, uh, also as a source of cryptography and uh, uh, products, and also the security token. Um, uh, it's uh, joined the EMC in 2006, and has been the security division since that, since that time. As, um, as Dee mentioned, uh, there will be three of us presenting in the webinar today. Um, I'll actually return at the end to talk in some detail about the specific plans for v.next. But preceding me will be Tony Cox, as Dee mentioned, and also John Lisebor. So with that, um, I'll turn over the microphone to, uh, uh, to uh, Tony Cox to talk briefly about the agenda and then to lead into the first, the first topic. Tony? Thank you, Bob. Hi, I'm Tony Cox from Cripsoft. Cripsoft provide a range of KMIP client and server software development kits and have been actively participating in the OASIS KMIP Technical Committee since 2010. As Bob indicated, we'll start by looking at what KMIP has accomplished in the three years since the committee was founded in, in 2009. We completed the version 1 standard in 2010 and have just completed our 1.1 version. So what's included in KMIP to date and what problems is it solving? We begin the development of KMIP in response to two major problems. The first of these was the lack of interoperability across key management environments. Say you had an encrypting tape drive from a particular vendor. Could that tape drive talk to any key manager available in the market? Typically not. Most cryptographic applications, like encrypted storage, application enc encryption environments, or database encryption products, had their own key management environments and talked only to those environments. This meant that an enterprise was using encryption or other cryptographic capabilities like digital certificates would likely have several different key managers resulting in increased operational, training and infrastructure costs. This was the first problem we addressed with KMIP. That is, we wanted to create a single protocol that different cryptographic environments, tape drives from different vendors, application encryption SDKs from different vendors, database encryption applications from different vendors and so on, could use to talk to any key manager that supported the protocol. One vendor's tape drive should be able to request keys from another vendor's key manager for purposes of encryption and decryption. An application using one vendor's key management library should be able to talk to another key manager if an enterprise was already using that key manager for tape encryption. A particular database encryption environment should be able to use KMIP to talk to another vendor's key manager if a business was already using that key manager, and so on. The goal was to establish a robust protocol that addressed the common requirements for interaction between cryptographic environments and key managers, reducing the operational, training and infrastructure costs for key management in the enterprise. 
The second problem we wanted to solve with KMIP was to reduce operational infrastructure and implementation costs by enabling individual cryptographic software development kits to talk to multiple key managers. This would again reduce the key management costs and risk for enterprises, such as the cost of developing and maintaining expertise in different SDKs. With KMIP, an SDK that uses KMIP can talk to multiple key managers as long as those key managers support the KMIP protocol. Developers could learn one set of tools and perform only one integration regardless of what key manager an enterprise might use. Moreover, changes in key management strategy could be put in place without having to retrofit applications to talk to different key managers. The first version of KMIP established the most critical elements of a single protocol that could address these critical issues confronting the enterprises. Within the areas where the need for an interoperable protocol was most strongly voiced by enterprises, especially data encryption environments such as tape drives, storage arrays, applications and databases, most interactions were based on requests initiated in the client environment and responded to by a key manager. For example, get a new encryption key, get the key corresponding to this identifier, store this key that a device has created. These and other operations initiated by the client were the core of most key management systems and led us to design a request response protocol in which most operations occurred as a result of a client request. We established a common format for messages that enabled clients and servers to express the objects, attributes and operations that were requested. As in the example shown here, a request for a specific key might include the unique identifier for the key. The response would include the value for the key, which could then be used by the cryptographic environment for encryption or decryption. The request can also return other information about the key, such as that it is a symmetric key. KMIP defines a set of objects, operations and attributes that can be used within this request response model. The objects include symmetric keys, asymmetric keys and certificates. KMIP also provides support for templates that can be used to establish default attribute values when creating an object. Various attributes are available for these objects such as a unique identifier for the object, the state of the object in terms of the key lifecycle, time related attributes such as creation date and so on. Some of these attributes like unique ID are common to all objects, others like certificate issuer are unique to one or more objects. These objects can be used in a variety of operations. One can get both symmetric and asymmetric keys for example. There are also operations that are specific to certain kinds of objects such as certify operations used with digital certificates. Although most operations follow the request response model, KMIP also defines two operations, notify and push, that can be initiated by the server rather than the client. These serve special purposes, such as enabling servers to ensure that a client receives notification when a cryptographic object has been compromised. The request and response messages are encoded at the transport level. Each object operation and attribute is expressed by a tag identifying that object, operation or attribute. The tag is followed by an identifier of the data type for the value that's being provided and the type is followed by the link and value of that object, attribute or operation. Expressing the message in TTLV enables the protocol to be used in the broadest possible range of environments. Other expressions of the protocol such as using XML or JSON, though not yet specified in the KMIP standard, can be used at higher levels in the stack, making it easier for different environments to interact with the protocol. KMIP allows significant flexibility in expressing messages, such as in being able to represent the attributes either by name or by tag value, depending on the context. This example shows us how to request for key, using the get operation could be encoded. Alternatively, the name rather than the unique ID can be used when, the, when attributes of the object are being modified. KMIP takes advantage of secure channels established using TLS to ensure the confidentiality and integrity of the request and response messages. Interoperability is encouraged by requiring that all implementations claiming conformance must support TLS 1.0 at a minimum. Later versions of TLS can be optionally supported and are routinely exercised in KMIP interoperability tests and events. One such interoperability event was held at the RSA conference in San Francisco in February of this year. A similar event was held at RSA conference the previous year and another such event is being planned for the RSA conference in 2013. 
The events held in the Oasis booth in the conference exhibition hall demonstrated interaction between clients and servers from different vendors according to a well-defined set of tests that exercised a broad range of KMIP functionality. These events built on the substantial interop testing that is routinely performed as part of our work on the KMIP standard. The test cases that we exercised in this interoperability event are used extensively by members of the KMIP TC to validate the protocol and to ensure that different implementations of KMIP can indeed work together. The test cases exercise a broad range of functionality representing common key management requirements such as creating and getting keys, changing key attributes, archiving keys and so on. The test cases are expressed in an illustrative document that provides details of the messages and encoding so that the different implementations can confirm they are building the messages and interpreting the standard in compatible ways. Conformance to KMIP is expressed in terms of profiles, representing groupings of functionality that address real-life needs, such as vaulting keys that are created within a storage environment. The profiles are expressed in a normative document that identifies the functionality to be used when implementing a profile. They also define the authentication that must be used with that profile to ensure the, the message confidentiality and integrity. Finally, KMIP also has a usage guide. And not illustrative document that provides detailed guidance on how to use the KMIP protocol. Information in the document includes guidance on the notify and put operations, explanation of key states represented in KMIP attributes and operations, how to use KMIP templates and many other topics. These accomplishments in version 1.0 and 1.1 have created a robust and effective key management protocol that's already implemented in a number of project, uh, products and achieving increasing acceptance through the industry but there are new challenges in key management that KMIP has to respond to. I'll turn the microphone over to my colleague John Leesabal, who will discuss these new CAP challenges. John? Thanks, Tony. Hi, I'm John Leesabal. I'm CTO for Quintessence Labs. I head up a scientific and engineering team developing quantum technology used in high-speed entropy sources, key management systems, virtual zerization storage products and other cybersecurity products. I'm also a member of the OASIS KMIP Technical Committee. I'll be talking about some of the new challenges in key management that we believe need to be addressed in the KMIP standard. I'll share some of the questions that we have been asking ourselves in the KMIP Technical Committee about how KMIP needs to develop to support secure operations in the cloud, to better support virtualization, to work with hardware security modules, to integrate better with businesses using PJ. PGP, to take advantage of new protocols such as quantum key distribution and to support dynamically allocated shared key streams for applications such as secure video conferencing. In the past several years, we've seen tremendous changes in information technology. Mobile devices and virtualization have transformed the ways users interact with applications and how IT infrastructure is deployed and managed. Service-based approaches to application development have shifted developer interest towards new representations such as XML and JSON. Big data has transformed business analytics. Cloud has offered new models for the rapid and cost-effective allocation of resources for the corporate initiatives. This transformation in computing is creating incredible new opportunities for collaboration, communication and innovation. This webinar is an example of those opportunities bringing together speakers and attendees from around the world to share information about where we're going with KMIP. But this transformation is also creating new vulnerabilities that cyber criminals, hacktivist groups and nation states have learned to exploit. Attackers are getting more sophisticated, combining multiple attack vectors with extensive research into the targets of their attacks. Cryptography offers substantial capabilities in addressing the threats and supporting these new capabilities. For example, data encryption is already being used extensively for protection of information that is entrusted to the public cloud. But effective use of cryptography requires careful attention to keys. How have the changes in business and IT affected key management? And what do those changes imply for the future of KMIP in particular? In deploying applications in private, public, community and hybrid clouds, there are lots of places where cryptography is already being used, from establishing secure channels to encrypting sensitive information 
to authenticating users and entities. But many of the implications for key management are still being explored. For example, there's increasing interest in having data encryption performed in applications that are deployed into cloud services, platforms and infrastructure. But many enterprises want to keep key management inside the enterprise. In this hybrid cloud model, keys have to be distributed from the enterprise to the cloud service provider environment, either directly to an application performing encryption or to a key manager dedicated to that tenant. This approach has the benefit of enabling all encryption to take place within the contracted resources at the cloud service provider. It has the drawback of requiring keys to be transported outside the enterprise environment, increasing their vulnerability to attack. For example, if the keys are entrusted temporarily to an application in the cloud for purposes of encryption or decryption, how does the enterprise know that keys are not inadvertently exposed as they move across the CSP infrastructure? This raises the question of what this use of key management for the cloud implies for KMIP. Are the current objects, operations and attributes sufficient to handle the use cases for key management for the cloud across all of the deployment models that may be used? Even within the enterprise, security requirements have become more complex. For example, virtualization enables the movement of workloads across a geographically dispersed infrastructure in order to make the most efficient possible use of resources. What does that mean for the relationship between routes of trust, such as those provided by hardware security modules, and the applications and key managers that rely on that highly secure environment? In many cases, HSMs need to remain in physically protected and highly controlled environments, while the key manager and cryptographic applications can move more freely across a virtual infrastructure. In that case, how does the enterprise ensure the secure distribution of keys, their use only in authenticated and authorised applications, and restrictions on their movement into particular geographical locations or particular instantiations of the infrastructure? Once again, are there new objects, operations and attributes needed in KMIP to address these new complexities in enterprise security requirements? There are many important cryptographic environments where key management is crucial that have not yet been addressed by KMIP. For example, there are objects and relationships that are unique to a PGP environment, both as a standard and as a vendor product that are not currently represented in KMIP. For example, PGP links together multiple keys pertaining to a single user in a way that KMIP doesn't currently represent. Similarly, PGP has concepts such as the additional decryption key, or ADK, also something not directly represented in KMIP. How should the protocol represent the unique capabilities of PGP and other environments? To what extent can those unique requirements be represented in the existing protocol? adapting or generalising capabilities that are already there? To what extent does effective support for the, those environments require new objects, attributes and operations? There are also new cryptographic technologies that are transforming such critical areas as trust establishment and secure delivery of key material. Quantum key distribution, or QKD, for example, is already being used in commercial and government solutions taking advantage of quantum effects present in light transmitted through an optical channel to detect and respond to eavesdropping and other attacks. Using a quantum channel, a stream of true random numbers can be shared between endpoints and used directly or as seed material for cryptographic keys for a variety of cryptographic purposes. KMIP is already being used as the key management protocol laid on top of a QKD system. What additions or changes to KMIP are needed to strengthen support for this and other new technologies. To what extent can the streaming modelling technologies such as quantum key distribution be applied to other environments such as secure video streaming? To what extent should these broader requirements be supported in KMIP? In all these areas, opportunities in new technologies, new business models and new development capabilities have to be addressed in the context of ever more aggressive and sophisticated attackers. The kinds of attackers who are targeting businesses, industries and the academic community have changed. 
including not only cyber criminals, but also nation states and non-state actors such as terrorists and hacktivists. These attackers are using new as well as established models for their attacks. For example, advanced attacks combine social engineering, zero-day vulnerabilities and in-depth investigation of targets in order to extract valuable information and intellectual property from their victims. The attackers can have many reasons for their attacks, including not only financial gain, but also disruption of business or critical infrastructure. Cryptographic keys can be targeted by attackers for many reasons, including as part of a larger strategy to get to information that has been secured by encryption. These changes in the profiles of attackers, in the kinds of attacks, and in the targets of attacks have a number of implications for KMIP. Are the attack models that KMIP must address well enough understood? Are there new capabilities for integrity, confidentiality and availability that are needed in KMIP in the light of the new threat landscape? Given these challenges, what needs to be done as we begin to work on the next version of KMIP? I'll hand the microphone back to Bob. We'll discuss the direction that we've been setting for KMIP v.next in the light of these and other challenges. Great, thank you, Bob. John. Uh, thank you, Tony, as well. Um, well before talking about KMIP v.next, I'd also like to mention really the incredible support um, that many companies, many individuals have given to KMIP, uh, represented not only by John, John and Tony's participation in in this web webinar, but also in the actual work that we're doing on KMIP uh, v.next. Uh, as I go along, I'll mention some of those individuals. Um, I'm sure I will not mention everyone, and my apologies for those I, I don't mention. But I think it's helpful in, in talking about KMIP to recognize how broad a base of support from how many vendors in how many different areas um, we've been able to draw on it in developing the standard and in moving forward with KMIP v.next. We had a face-to-face -face meeting back in February of this year um, in which we decided that in order to move forward, we really needed to define the use cases that we wanted to address in the standard. Prior to this in 1.0 and 1.1, we really focused primarily on storage use cases, uh, areas that were well understood by most of the, the committee members um, that to some degree limited us in terms of, of the scope. But as, as John has described, the, the complexities that we're facing uh, in terms of key management really have driven us to think about use cases as the mechanism that will help, help us both to scope the work for v.next, but also to understand what those, um, what those areas mean in terms of what we have to support in, in KMIT. Um, certainly the areas of, of tape encryption, storage array encryption, application encryption, database encryption that Tony described are still critical areas. In fact, we, we believe there are still important enhancements to the protocol that, that would help in supporting those areas. But we are clearly moving into new, into new territory in things like um, PGP, uh, areas like uh, client registration as well, server-to-server -server interactions, and the streaming of key material that, that John described. Addressing these new areas might also mean extending the charter for the, the technical committee. When we established the, the KMIP committee in February of 2009, we did put some items out of scope in order to help us focus on the areas we thought were most critical. As we've been exploring these new areas through use cases, we've been finding that, um, that they've led us into areas we thought uh, originally we could exclu exclude from the standard, things like client registration, for example. And the use cases, therefore, have helped us to understand where we might need to extend the scope of the charter in order to really address these, these areas, um, these new areas of functionality. The use cases were driven um, by Mike Allen from Symantec, uh, and Dennis Poshua from SafeNet, who were the editors of the new use case document, but were contributed to by a, a broad spectrum of folks in the tech, technical committee. Uh, John, for example, in terms of quantum key distribution, uh, folks from Cryptsoft, Tim Hudson, for example, uh, in terms of areas like cloud. Um, and I'll talk a bit about those contributions as I look at each of these areas. One, one thing that the use cases have clearly indi indicated to us is that we're going to need, need to extend the protocol. Um, 
we do believe that the, the protocol as it stands currently addresses uh, the vast majority of what's needed in the use cases. But we have found a number of places, for example, in terms of, of PGP, where there are missing objects or attributes or operations that we may be able to represent in terms of existing capabilities, but may be better represented as new objects, um, attributes or operations, or extensions of existing ones. Um, these cases have really helped us to, to understand these issues, and we believe that in scoping out the work for v.next, um, we will see some significant areas of, of enhancement in terms of the protocol, um, and also in terms of usage information. Uh, the, uh, one of the critical uh, aspects of developing KMIP has, to, has been to not only create the specification for the protocol, work that's been driven largely by Robert Haas of IBM and also by Matthias Bjergqvist of IBM, who have done the lion's share of editing uh, uh, for the 1.0 and 1.1 protocol specifications but also in terms of identifying um, those areas where explanation of how to use KMIT was really critical in order for people to, to take full advantage of the protocol. Uh, as Tony expressed, that information was captured in a usage guide. Uh, the editors for that, Indra Fitzgerald of HP and Judy Furlong of EMC, have really gathered together a tremendous amount of information, both on the specifics of using the protocol and on, on how to implement various kinds of, of requirements. Um, uh, things like, for example, how to use the, the notify and, and push operations, uh, which are, are so different from the client client server opera operations that the rest of the protocol supports. One of the critical aspects in, in KMIP has been the, the interop testing that we've done so far, including both within the committee and also in public demonstrations, again, as Tony described. That testing program has been critical in terms of uh, enabling us to understand whether or not the protocol was actually accomplishing what we wanted to, wanted to accomplish, and, and flushing out the areas where there were ambiguities or where we needed additional support in order to really achieve interoperability. For example, in 1.1, we needed to add stronger support for versioning of the protocol so that different implementations could tell what version of a server they were talking to. And similarly, in terms of vendor extensions, both looking at, at where various vendors had to implement extensions to accomplish what they needed to accomplish, and where we could bring those together in uh, new elements of the protocol that would eliminate the need for those extensions. One of the decisions in 1.2, initiated more than a year ago now, and led largely by Gordon Arnold of IBM and Steve Warenga of HP, has been to establish not only the, the uh, intra-committee testing and also the interop events, but really a formal testing program that would allow um, a much more extensive testing by various vendors of their implementations of the protocol against a broad range of especially server environments. That formal testing program is still in process. We hope to have an announcement uh, shortly, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a moment. But we believe that this is an essential piece of actually achieving the interoperability that's the core, the core of what we're trying to accomplish. Essential to that program is to have the test cases that will allow the instrumentation of, of test harness and the actual running of tests against that environment. Um, again, as Tony mentioned, we have quite an extensive suite of tests already which were largely used to validate the protocol and have been used within the committee um, to ensure that various implementations uh, work effectively together, but also as a mo means for us to define the interoperability events uh, that occurred in 2011, 2012, and that's targeted for 2013. Those test cases are captured in a, in a document um, created and, and largely edited by, again, by Matthias Bjerkvist of IBM, um, and increasingly uh, helped by, by Tim Hudson of Cryptsoft. Those test cases themselves um, have been essential in establishing an interoperable protocol, but they're not sufficient in terms of defining what it means to be a compliant implementation for KMIP. 
the model we used for that conformance um, uh, specification was a, a profile, that is, a specification of a group of a, a set of functionality um, that made sense for a business purpose. Things like, for example, uh, if a tape drive wants to vault a key with a key, ma a key manager, that should be a profile. We call that uh, the, a key vault profile. Um, similarly, if a, if a storage array wants to request a key from a key manager, it should be able to have a group of functionality that accomplishes that and demonstrate its conformance for that profile. Uh, we call that the key store, uh, key store profile, key store and key, key create. These, these profiles intended to allow us to define um, critical areas in which especially a client implementation might want to declare conformance to KMIT um, really need to be revised in 1.2. We see the need to map them more directly into the actual vendor implementations that are emerging. We're trying to establish, therefore, a simpler model for the profiles and also to make it simpler to uh, have other organizations create profiles um, for KMIT so that, uh, for example, a storage uh, standards group might define a KMIT profile unique to that environment. We believe by doing this, we can significantly increase both the, the ease of expressing conformance to KMIT, but also encourage its, its, its wider use. The areas that John mentioned, in terms of the, the major issues that we believe we, we need to address, really have driven the use case definition, um, which again have enabled us to do the scoping and also the investigation of, of what we would include in v.next. For example, in terms of, of the cloud environments, we looked at several deployment models. Um, the one shown here is for a hybrid cloud model in which uh, for a given solution, a significant part of that solution resides within the enterprise, but another significant part of it resides within a cloud service provider. Um, in this particular example, We've shown the enterprise application inside the cloud service provider, along with application data, but the key management uh, server and associated components like the, the key database and the hardware security module residing inside the enterprise. In looking at this particular de uh, deployment model, for example, we've identified a number of use cases, um, not only in terms of things like individual key requests from registered clients, um, but also in terms of uh, issues like moving large numbers of keys from the enterprise environment to the cloud service provider. Perhaps, for example, for caching, or perhaps there's a subsidiary key manager in the cloud environment um, that serves as a, a secondary repository for keys on behalf of the, of the tenant environment. There are also use cases such as um, coordination of, of policy between the enterprise environment and the cloud. Um, issues like, for example, defining the lifetime of the keys that are entrusted to the cloud service provider. In looking at these use cases, again, much of the work here was, was led by Jim Hudson, Judy Furlong, Kieran Thoda of, of VMware, myself, um, but many other individuals as well, including conversations with folks not in the committee, like Microsoft. Um, we've uncovered a number of implications for KMIT. Those use cases around tenant administration, key migration, and policy distribution, for example, led us to look at, at things like how does, um, should the protocol distinguish among tenants as keys are propagated from a, a given enterprise into a multi-tenant uh, cloud service provider key management environment. If you do want to perform bulk input and, and export and import of keys, how much of that operation should be visible as a single operation in KMIT as opposed to batches of, of individual key operations, for example. If we do need to propagate policy from the enterprise environment to the cloud service provider, for example, in terms of uh, expiring a key, changing its, its, uh, its lifetime because of changes in, for example, the risk profile for that application or that environment. Should that be done as a first class object, a new policy object perhaps represented, for example, by 
a standard like Xaml? Or should it be simply in terms of modification of attributes that embed the policy for that, for that object? And finally, cloud especially raised for us critical issues of, of registering clients, especially because you, once you set up the initial relationship between the enterprise and the cloud service provider, you may well have multiple applications or other environments that are registering and deregistering automatically between those environments. And it may be important for, for Cayman to support these kinds of both manual and automated registration models. Stan Feather of HP has done a lot of the work in this area for us, looking at, at fundamental models of registration across all of the areas in which KMIP is being used, looking at, at which of these need to be represented as new first-class objects, which of them we can handle by means of adapting existing capabilities in KMIP, and which things we, we want to defer into uh, versions beyond v.next. Uh, for example, the complexities of policy representation and propagation of policy between the enterprise and the cloud service provider are probably things that, that are larger than we want to put into a v.next. But again, we're still looking at exactly these issues and using the use cases to scope out what we'll do in the next version. In the second area that, that John talked about, the complexity of, of enterprise security, and in particular with regard to uh, models for use of hardware security modules, uh, both within the enterprise and across enterprise boundaries. We also have seen a number of critical use cases that, that we believe we need to address uh, in Cayman. For example, one of the most fundamental issues, if you're using communication between a hardware security module and, for example, a key server in a separate security domain is the trust establishment between those domains. Is it sufficient, for example, to rely on a secure channel and identifying uh, mechanisms like certificates uh, that can be used as the way to register or uh, manage uh, authentication and authorization for the uh, HSM and key servers? If the uh, HSM is talking to a key server within the same environment, can we largely ignore those kinds of issues relying on the trust that the HSM has already established? Or are there issues in terms of, for example, proxying of those of requests between the key servers that require us to think about new mechanisms for trust establishment, such as wrapped keys? The protection of the keys in transit is clearly a critical issue especially given that the hardware security module is the root of trust in many enterprises and increasingly used not only within the enterprise but also environments like cloud service providers. What do we require in KMIP in terms of protection of keys in transit? Is it sufficient what we have currently in terms of wrapped keys? Or do we, do we need to go beyond that in terms of, for example, expression of wrapped, uh, wrapped mechanisms within the message format, not just in terms of key values? There are also implications in terms of uh, different properties and capabilities of different kinds of hardware security modules and other devices that may lead us to, to need to represent the device types themselves in order to be able to understand particular requirements and capabilities on those devices. Similarly, there are currently uh, vendor extensions that support both different kinds of operations and different kinds of devices. To what extent do we need to move those extensions into standard parts of the protocol? To what extent do those extensions um, need to be simply used? And does our extension mechanism itself need to be improved? At the moment, at least, we have a, 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 a critical understanding that there are at least certain kinds of metadata-only objects um, that are uh, needed within this, this environment that will need to support in some way and are looking at whether we can represent those within the current protocol. As John mentioned, environments like uh, Pretty Good Privacy, PGP, both as a standard and as a product, raise issues for us in terms of the representation of objects, attributes, and operations from those environments within KMIP. One of our, the members of our committee, Mike Allen from Symantec, um, part of the acquisition of PGP by Symantec, um, has been exploring this in detail, creating the use cases for us, and also looking at the implications of those in terms of things like 
the representation of the linkages across objects within, uh, within PGP. Use cases like how users are registered and how they look up keys, how signing is done, and how, how trust is validated have led us to look at, at the protocol in terms of how we represent the objects, PGP keys, and the hierarchy of keys, and whether or not there are uh, new kinds of link attributes, for example, that we might have to create in order to represent those operations, uh, structures, and uh, objects. It's also possible that there are new kinds of identifiers. Um, for example, in terms of representing um, the additional decryption keys that John, John mentioned, that kind of hierarchical structure is not something we represent directly inside KMIP. Uh, having it could well be an extremely valuable um, new capability for other uses well beyond PGP. And the kinds of interrelationships among signatures that PGP supports also goes beyond what we represent currently, both in terms of mechanisms, um, uh, for example, cryptographic operations, um, and in terms of the relationship among, uh, among signed objects. Again, this, we believe, is an area that may be of value well beyond PGP itself, and are looking um, carefully at, for example, extending um, the protocol to support cryptographic operations, not only those related to certificates, for example, uh, we do recertify currently, but also in terms of core cryptographic operations such as encrypt, uh, decrypt, uh, sign verify, and so on. It's been extremely valuable to look at environments like PGP in order to understand this, these broader implications for KMIP, not trying to, to boil the ocean and solve all the problems in key management, but to recognize that extensions to the protocol could make it more flexible and more useful across the board. One of the areas that has um, driven us uh, most into looking at fundamental concepts about, about KMIP has been the world of quantum key distribution that John described. The streaming model that John described is uh, fundamentally different from the discrete objects that we've largely paid attention to so far. And yet the model itself is clearly a critical one in terms of uh, cryptographic operations and, for example, the ability to create uh, ran, ran, random, uh, random seeds and other, other new kinds of objects. Areas that, for example, have already shown up in new, case, new use cases, such as in the ability to create attestations on things like requests for keys, ways of doing verification that the requester and the provider are indeed uh, who they think they are and are valid participants, participants in this exchange. We believe that the use cases for quantum key distribution, things like the trust establishment, have led us into uh, critical new areas in terms of potential capabilities for, uh, for KMIP v.next. Not only in terms of stream-related operations, but even more fundamentally in terms of, of core elements of the protocol, such as these cryptographic operation capabilities, that will really make the protocol both more flexible and more useful across all of these areas and others that we've been uh, seeing as essential for key management. In all of these areas, in all the things we're looking at for v.next, our goal is, is really to continue to drive forward with highly effective interoperability. We all believe that this is a critical and fundamental problem, exactly the one that Tony described at the very start of this webinar that the ability to have a single server talk to multiple clients, a single client talk to multiple servers, a single SDK uh, support multiple servers, and a single server talk to multiple vendor SDKs really is the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. And therefore, the demonstration of that interoperability is really core to the success of Cayman. It's certainly a great challenge. And for that reason, we believe that a formal testing program that helps vendors um, understand whether or not they've achieved the interoperability that we believe is essential for the success of KMIP is really a critical step, uh, a critical next step for us with KMIP and an essential part of e.next. That program has to include at least three major parts. Clearly, the testing program itself 
is a, uh, a critical element. The design, implementation, management, measurement, reporting of the tests that are being run. We believe in this area support from a formal organization will be of, of huge help uh, to us in being able, be able to establish such a program. Second, the specification itself needs to be reviewed and expertise in that specification needs to be mentored. We need to be able to track changes, we need to be able to map out the architecture in which the tests are being run, and we need, need to be able to create uh, on an ongoing basis the test cases that will instrument interoperability. And finally, we need to continue to develop, review, and run the test harness itself, tracking revisions, monitoring delivery mechanisms, making sure we have agreement about the harness and the tests that are being instrumented, and also that there be public availability of results um, as agreed to by participants to make sure that companies who are looking to, to use key management servers and clients have a, a reputable place to go to understand whether or not a given implementation has gone through effective testing that demonstrates interoperability. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be having an announcement about this, I hope within the next month or so, uh, uh, discussing in detail how this program is being instrumented, uh, what organizations will assist us, and uh, making sure that all those who uh, are looking for effective interoperability testing with KMIP will be able to, to find the information that they need. This work, as I mentioned, is being driven largely by Gordon Arnold of IBM, uh, with uh, Steve Warenger acting as a, a critical uh, resource for us in developing that program. In all of these areas, we would welcome your assistance. We see the development of KMIP as a critical standard for the industry. Um, I did, in fact, uh, I write blogs often. You'll find my blogs on uh, the RSA site, rsa.com, and I've written about the importance of KMIP as well as other standards. We, we hope that you'll join us in this work. Um, it has significant benefits, we believe, uh, for all of the members in terms of the ability to influence the standard, um, making sure that, that use cases and business requirements are represented, being able to tap into the knowledge that members of the committee have, being able to help all of us push the standard into the areas where it, where it needs to go. We would welcome your, your, your assistance, welcome your comments, um, welcome your questions. Um, as Dee mentioned, uh, any questions that you give us during the webinar, uh, we will definitely answer. Myself and, and Subhash uh, will take the lead on that, but we'll also draw on other members of the committee. Um, I, you're also very welcome to contact Subhash and myself using the kmip-chair at lists.oasisopen.org. Um, we welcome uh, any comments, questions uh, about the standard, and look forward to, uh, to your participation. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. I hope it's been useful for you. It's certainly our pleasure to be able to share this information. And again, we welcome any comments, questions, and hope to see you in Cayman.